Hello everyone, I'm Dr Paul Rose and in this short presentation I'd like to explain what we mean about the use of evidence for zoo and aquarium animal husbandry and how we can make the zoo evidence-based by using a mixture of wild information as well as data from research that we conduct on the animals that we are keeping. Zoo animal science has been around for a long time. People have been studying the animals that they are keeping to look at effects of lifespans, of population sustainability, and of illness and disease in animals in captivity. And originally, such research was quite selfish. How can I investigate how my animal is kept so I can keep it alive for longer? Now, much of the research that is conducted concerns animal welfare and how we can best ensure the attainment of positive welfare states in the animals that we are keeping. Until fairly recently, there has been bias in the research that has been conducted in the animals that we are investigating. These flamingos, for example, one of the most commonest species housed in the zoo, have in the past been subject to relatively few studies. So let's look where this bias might come from. This is a paper from Professor Vicky Melfi that was published in Zoo Biology in 2009. It shows you the number of zoos that house a particular species as the dark grey bar, the number of projects that have been performed on the animals in those zoos in light grey, and the number of individual animals themselves as the line with the dot. You can see that projects are dominated by the great apes, bonobos and chimpanzees. However, a relatively small number of zoos house these species. Flamingos occur in the middle of the graph. There are three species of flamingo housed in a relatively large number of zoos that in themselves house an incredibly large number of individual birds. However, relatively few projects are performed on them. And even fewer projects are performed on species of reptile that you can find at the end of the graph. So it seems that zoo science has previously focused on large enigmatic mammals, such as these chimpanzees. And there might be a relatively large number of reasons for that. Human behaviour researchers that have formed the basis for zoo animal science might be more familiar with these species. Wild research might have been conducted more commonly on these species in the past. And therefore, we have a better baseline for understanding these animals in captivity. And we may simply be drawn to the study of our closest ancestors because we find them more interesting. We can relate to them and therefore we can identify any welfare or quality of life concerns more closely. However, in the 10 years since that paper was published, we have seen zoo science move forward and investigate and encompass a wider range of taxonomic groups and a wider range of research questions. And this enhancement of research questions across taxa is one of the best ways that we have of ensuring that our zoo animal husbandry becomes more evidence based. Both using evidence from across different animal collections in conjunction with what we know about that species from the wild to implement that into new, reviewed, best practice husbandry standards. This is a paper that I published in 2019 with some of my colleagues. It aimed to update the findings from the Melfi paper from 2009. You can see that zoos are diversifying the types of projects they are producing. However, mammals still dominate, even though mammalian taxa are not the most species of animals housed in the zoo. We can see in some cases, such as birds for example, an increase in published output. And we can also see that there are declines in other species too, for example reptiles. This might reflect the trends in publishing the trends in researchers working on those animals between zoos and universities and it might also reflect 
the nature of the animal collection that is closest to those zoo researchers or academic institutions and how the animal collection itself has changed concerning the types of animals that are being kept. What is clear from this graph is that we still have much more work to do in species like amphibians and fish, where number of projects are incredibly small compared to the overall number of species housed in zoological collections. This is a graph of publication output. What it doesn't show you is the number of projects actually conducted within the zoo that might never get published, for example, student theses. It might be that many amphibian, fish or reptile studies are conducted, but do not find their way into the scientific literature. So we have encouraged further dissemination of such projects because ultimately they can help us improve and enhance husbandry and care for a wider range of species. We know that data collection really helps our understanding of zoo animal husbandry. For example, simple husbandry techniques, such as the provision of browse, cut tree branches, to browsing ungulates, is now seen as daily essential management. It is not seen as something that is just environmental enrichment. Browse for browsers is a key part of their daily husbandry regime. And the findings of research that has shown the importance of browse to animal health has helped implement that husbandry change. So how can data bring about husbandry change? This slide explains the methods that we used in that 2019 paper to search the literature to find out where zoos were publishing and what they were publishing on. So this systematic literature search occurred in the Journal Database Web of Science and we assessed peer-reviewed articles that were published on in-zoo research and in aquarium research from 2009 to 2018. And overall, we collected 1,063 articles. We looked at the different taxonomic classes of the animals that also included invertebrates, but they were mentioned separately and I'll come on to them at the end. We also looked at the aims, outcomes and the gain, i.e. knowledge or subject gain, based on the article's findings. And we wanted to look at whether or not this predicted what was going to be published in the future. Will we see more welfare articles appearing in the future? Will we be seeing more subject specific articles in the future? What research is currently seen as a priority? For example, are zoos prioritising welfare because it's visible to the general public? Because zoo visitors are more likely now, based on increased education and awareness of animal welfare, to spot potential welfare issues in the animals that they're observing. So we wanted to look at this output across taxonomic classes, not only to see why there might be biases still in output, but also to identify any continued existing gaps in research knowledge where we could help guide the development of future research questions. Zoos are obviously keen to investigate species that have in the past presented them with welfare problems. For example, in polar bears, which we know are prone to abnormal repetitive behaviours. But zoos have used the findings of research to evolve the enclosure design and husbandry regimes of polar bears to encourage the performance of naturalistic behaviours that enhance the animal's welfare. So we do have evidence in the scientific literature of where zoos have used information from the wild, for example, how large is a polar bear's territory? How many steps does a polar bear take per day? What is the feeding and foraging regime of the polar bear? And how does it split up its day into various activities? So that feeding times, so that enrichment trials, and so that husbandry and enclosure features can be based on this wild ecology. We need to remember that not all types of wild behaviour can 
and should be performed in captivity. So research output that continues on these species to reassess and reevaluate how husbandry and management works for that species might explain why there is still a bias to some species still being performed in zoos and still appearing in the scientific literature. However, this bias might therefore ensure that scenes like this of outdated, unhelpful types of enclosure do eventually disappear from zoos because the research that has been conducted has shown there are better and more biologically relevant ways of housing that animal that are based on ecological evidence and empirical data. These are the findings from our 2019 paper. We've got the different taxonomic classes, the specific order, i.e. the type of that taxonomic class that was most commonly studied, as well as the commonest aims, outcomes and gain in knowledge from that paper. For fish, it was sharks that were most commonly studied, although the number of papers is tiny. For amphibians, it was frogs and toads. For reptiles, it was squamata, for example, the lizards. For birds, it was phenicoptera forms, the flamingos. And for mammals, perhaps unsurprisingly, it was primates. But you can still see the huge number of primate papers compared to the other taxonomic orders. Behaviour, husbandry and applied research dominates the aims of this data set. And the outcomes of this data set are relatively broad, encompassing developments to animal husbandry, as well as assessment of information on the animals themselves, which we've called pure biology. However, for some taxonomic groups, the outcome has a very particular need. For example, in the case of fish, we can see that animal and ecosystem health is a key feature of research output. And that might be based on the ecosystem indicators that are presented by that type of animal. This research output suggests that these papers generally have a specific advancement in knowledge, suggesting the species specific or perhaps case study approach of zoo research is really useful in informing best practice for particular types of animal. What is interesting about these findings is that when we look particularly at animal welfare, we see that 41 articles solely focused on a welfare aim, and 93% of these were particularly focused on mammals. So we do have evidence there where there is a need to diversify the types of welfare science that is published on. We also need to think about where welfare knowledge goes. And in 74% of articles that had a husbandry and welfare outcome, welfare was embedded into practice. It was embedded in the suggestions that authors gave for actually applying that paper to the zoo itself. And we can also see that things like the flamingo have come full circle from being one of the least studied but commonest species in the original 2009 Melfi paper to now dominating the taxonomic order for birds that appears in the published literature. And this may be because a drive towards answering a particular structured set of research questions on a particular taxonomic group can help focus where researchers study and where researchers publish. Invertebrates were not forgotten about in this research project, but they occurred incredibly infrequently in the overall data set. So consequently, we looked at them separately. We located 17 papers that had a particular welfare angle, and the majority of these focused on cephalopods, for example, octopus and cuttlefish. Welfare reviews of invertebrate taxa were also popular and had a relatively high impact suggesting that people do care about invertebrate welfare. They are interested in the arguments around invertebrate welfare and how those arguments can inform best practice. 
So there is clearly an appetite to develop measures for our understanding of what invertebrate welfare might look like. And consequently, that information will be particularly useful in developing husbandry regimes and enclosure designs to the types of invertebrates that we house in the zoo. 29% of these invertebrate papers were also interested in environmental enrichment. And this is really heartening because invertebrates can and should benefit from environmental enrichment when housed in captivity. For example, this diverse and differently structured leafcutter ant exhibit allows for the promotion of a range of feeding and foraging behaviours and natural social behaviours. The ants are encouraged to move around different parts of their exhibit. So this is a really nice example of how wild ecological knowledge of the ants travelling, feeding and social behaviours has been inputted into practice. From this study, we posed some priority research areas that could help increase research output and the number of publications on potentially understudied taxa. Whilst it is evident that mammals are popular in this research output, it is not all species of mammal that are investigated. Certain types of ungulates and rodents, for example, are not common in this data set. We also need to consider the range of domestic species that we house in the zoo. Who is investigating the welfare of the rabbits, for example, that are housed in the children's farm and are exposed to probably more impacts from visitors than some of the other more exotic species that we keep? We also need to think about diversifying the types of projects that we perform per taxa. For example, there might be other types of research question rather than just behavioural ones that we study on mammals. But we still need these relative basic ethogram style studies on fish and amphibians, whose time activity budgets we might not be able to find in the literature. And we also should think about descriptors of behavioural expression for a wider range of species, which will allow us to quantify the behavioural cues of different emotional states that can enable us to understand psychological aspects of animal welfare. And therefore, if we do better understand metrics for animal welfare cues across a wider range of taxa, we'll have a better understanding of quality of life approaches. Environmental enrichment, which is one of the best ways that we can improve quality of life in the zoo, can be enhanced by taking the approaches we have used in these highly studied mammals and using such methods on these less studied taxonomic groups, such as fish and invertebrates. Many of the enclosures that we use for species such as fish, like these antheas in this coral reef tank, automatically provide enrichment because of the structure and the nature of the water quality, the flow, temperature and water chemistry itself that all mimic the animal's wild environment. So enrichment might actually be built into some of the features of the exhibit for these lesser studied taxa. And therefore that might make welfare study easier because we are investigating the animal in a whole, complete, holistic environment. So long as we are aware of how the animal performs behaviour in the wild, and so long as we are aware of whether or not wild behaviour can translate into captivity, the use of wild ecological information is very useful to our understanding of where we might lack evidence for best practice husbandry in the zoo. By understanding time activity budgets, by understanding behavioural diversity, and by understanding the natural circadian rhythms of species, and how they move throughout the day and where they choose to spend their time performing particular activities can help us further design our enclosures and structure our exhibits to provide resources that promote the output of important behaviours. We also know that use of such wild data can help us to remove outdated or inappropriate husbandry practices
that further will enhance animal welfare. This is an example of a paper that I published with a colleague of mine that is available in the journal for the Flamingo Specialist Group of the IUCN. It shows a comparison of papers published on wild flamingo behaviour with that published on captive flamingo behaviour. You can see that these two time activity budgets for both study populations are relatively similar. However, a few notable differences are apparent. Wild flamingos spent a large proportion of their daily time activity budget feeding and foraging. Captive flamingos spend a much shorter amount of time feeding and foraging, but they spend a longer amount of time being inactive. There may be several reasons for this. Wild flamingos are foraging across a very large expanse of wetland where food patches can be infrequently and unevenly distributed. Captive flamingos are provided with a high energy, highly nutritious flamingo pellet, usually in a smaller area of their enclosure. So this lack of feeding time doesn't mean the birds in captivity are on a poorer plane of nutrition. It probably means they're getting a better diet than those birds in the wild, but it is having an impact on how the birds can spend their time. Consequently, we need to think about the other behaviours that occur around feeding and foraging, and whether or not this increased time spent inactive is bad for the birds' health and well-being. If we can promote beneficial activity by changing how flamingos get their pellet, by mirroring times in the day when they should be foraging, we could potentially shift this graph so this captive feeding time does better mimic the wild feeding time and ultimately the birds are spending time performing behaviours in a similar manner as free living birds would, which further promotes the educational messages of having such species in the zoo in the first place. We must remember that performance of wild type behaviours is no guarantee of good welfare in the zoo. But this use of evolutionary and ecological information is probably one of our best ways of understanding the usefulness of zoo husbandry to the species we are keeping. And it's probably one of the best ways that we have of deciding where we start our empirical study and where we need to go to collect more data to help us understand better the needs of the animals that we keep in the zoo. I hope this presentation has shown you the long way that zoos have traveled to collect and implement evidence for their husbandry practices. I also hope it's shown you where there are current gaps in our use of science and where we should continue to develop research questions so we can provide evidence-based husbandry guidelines for the majority of taxonomic groups that we are housing in our zoos and aquariums.